Hello and welcome to episode two of Play and Pretend with me, Chris McIlvenny. This episode, I am joined by the absolutely incredible Geraldine Hughes. Geraldine's from right here in West Belfast. She grew up in Davis Flats and it's great to hear her story and how she left the, the troubles, the war-torn Belfast in the 1980s and got herself out of here and uh, ended up a Hollywood movie star and a Broadway actor. It's quite an incredible story. You're going to really enjoy this one. So this is Geraldine Hughes. Uh, Geraldine, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, happy birthday, by the way. It was your birthday a few days ago, so happy birthday. Yes, it was. And I have a bone to pick with you and lots of other people about videos that you made for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so gorgeous. I had the most beautiful, beautiful birthday. It was a big one. So um, I celebrated quietly, but I felt very, very loved. So Unreal. Brilliant. Uh, so I normally start this by saying how uh, we first met, but we've never actually met in real life. It's really strange because I feel like I know you so well, but I've never actually met you in real life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was on Zoom and you made me a writer, so thanks for that. Uh, no, you made yourself a writer. You made <laughs> yourself a writer. Um, you've always been a writer, you just didn't know it. Um, yes, I, um, I created this virtual Zoom creative space for people if, um, when COVID started to come on and maybe collect and gather and write some things and share them. And you came on and... Um, your this show that you've written just fell out of your mouth just poured out of your body you were completely inspired and um and i will say also you know and i've said this before to you when you when we were first met you you're even the way you held yourself was very much like this and hiding behind a haircut that you much needed so i really sort of just saw this a lot and when you when you opened up, I mean, you have you have grown so much during this whole process. You know, mm -hmm. I can see it. Um, it's just incredible. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I well, if you hadn't started that Zoom, then I would still be hiding behind that terrible haircut. So uh, <laughs> thank you. I just want to start by uh, asking you. Um, so you grew up obviously in West Belfast, and it mm -hmm. was. At the height of the troubles, um, w w as a as a young girl in West Belfast at that time, the craziness of that, did you always have an interest in drama? Was it where did that come about? Yeah, well, um, I think I was always a very dramatic and a very emotional person. Like my mother would say, you know, I came out of the womb like Betty Davis, you know. Uh, <laughs> but um, for me, drama theater performing was an escape so um whenever I discovered that I could do it and I wasn't bad at it it's all I wanted to do because for me during that time there was so much going on in life there was so much war there was so much violence there was there was so much to be afraid of every single moment of every single day that as soon as I went into school, so the school itself, St. Louise's, <clears throat> was really a safe zone for me. I felt very safe there and very protected. And then to have this family of friends, only girls then at the time, and to be able to escape into different worlds and different characters and sing and dance and laugh, it felt like a normal way to live. It felt right. And as soon as I stepped out of the door of the school to head back home, I just went right back into being afraid. Um, mm -hmm. And so I suppose that's a big metaphor for me in general with as a performer. Um, I've I found this way to escape. Mm -hmm. What was ever was going on in my life, which was difficult up until, you know, up until the last decade of my life, I pretty much had a very turbulent life and stuff I don't really talk about very much publicly but it hasn't been an easy ride um, but when you when you grow up in a place like West Belfast I, you know there's this great saying at home say it'll harden you do people still say that yeah do they say that but it's not yeah, about the troubles something. it's not about if you fall <laughs> like it'll harden you <laughs> like, yeah it'll yeah. harden you yeah and so I felt like well you know I can get through, I can get through 
all of that, I can get through anything else. And um, so it did, it did harden me, but it also made me realize that I'm a survivor. And um, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a tough, tough, tough way to grow up. Mm -hmm. So then how did, uh, because then you were in a movie when at a very young age, uh, Children of the Crossfire. Yeah. How, how does that come about? Did they like yeah. approach, did, did they come to your school or did they find uh, down the street? What happened? Yeah, no, the, the nuns, the, the Sister Genevieve and then our, um, it was because of drama. It was because of drama. So the drama group were, were um, I think all the drama groups all around the schools, all around the entire island of Ireland were contacted by this production company and they were looking for four kids to be in this film. <laughs> and um, yeah, I was, the, yeah, I was, I was said auditions on Saturday, you're going to go meet this director. And, and I was like, yes, yes, yes. I, for me, anything was yes. I was like, yes, yes, yes. And so a lot of us, um, a lot of us were chosen and we went for that first meet and greet uh, and it was in the Europa Hotel and I'll never forget it. Um, George Schaefer was the director and Charlie Haid, who was famous for Hill Street Blues playing Renko and uh, Julia Duffy, Karen Valentine. Oh, it's just incredible. So then we went to Dublin for a, what we would say a recall at home, uh, call back and um, we had to tell a story and I think they just wanted to get to know who we were as kids, if we'd be able to handle this experience. Mm -hmm. And then I got the part and it was like 13 years old. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and, and so then uh, uh, some of it, a lot of it was filmed in LA, wasn't it? So you went out yeah. to LA at we 13. Went to LA. Yeah, we went to LA for six weeks, I think. And we stayed at the Sherman Oaks Inn on Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles and we then had a swimming pool. <laughs> we were like, oh. And we filmed in, in Los Angeles. And I mean, I just spent the whole time like, and I remember the first time someone took us on a, 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 a trip, you know, showing us around the place. And she said, uh, and this is Beverly Hills. And I remember looking at the mansions and like as a wide eyed child and I was like, who cleans those houses? <laughs> I just kept thinking, they're so big. It would take you like a whole day just to clean that bit. Yeah, and not, said, <laughs> not how do you end up living in a place like that? Like who cleans that? Those poor yeah, people. That was my thing. Yeah. yeah, I was like, oh, even though, look at the size of that window. <laughs> and she reminds me of that because I'm still friends with this beautiful woman brain. And she still reminds me of that. She's like, do you remember when I showed you the mansions and all you could think about was cleaning them? I said, you know, I'm a working class girl. I didn't ever think that I would be ever part of that, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it was a complete different world to you, especially Belfast at that time, being in LA and Sun. Actually, you probably didn't even know what Sun was being for Belfast. I remember getting off this TWA flight, which was the airline at the time that doesn't exist anymore. And, um, and I remember getting off the plane and feeling this wall of heat which of course now I was um, acclimated to this kind of heat, but I was like, this is like American heat. <laughs> you know, and I think, I wonder if I'll get an American tan, which of course I wasn't allowed to because of the film. Mm -hmm. But um, it was it was like landing on the moon. Yeah. You know, complete Erica or different planet. It was like, yeah, it was it was so crazy. It was crazy. So then after doing that movie, uh, you obviously went back to Belfast, finished out school. Did you always, after that, did you always know that this is what I want to do? Uh, sorry, this is Becky. She's oh, hi, missing. Becky. This is actually uh, uh, the great actor, Mandy Patinkin. This is his precious, gorgeous doggy. Wow. Yeah, he just dropped him off. So um, he just dropped her off because he's, anyway. Yeah, she's very famous on Instagram, Becky, uh, with Mandy and Catherine's videos. That's but uh, sorry, so it was a bit mad. And so, and I have two dogs here, so I'm navigating this. So this is probably the most distracted interview you'll ever have, but probably okay. the most natural. So <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> a real insight. It's like a reality insight, you know, no yeah. makeup, no lights, no hair. <laughs> so good. Uh, sorry, yeah, but it so, me. so um, yeah, so after the movie, 
you went back to Belfast and then did you know that that's what you wanted to do? Did you know that you wanted to come back to LA? Yes, I made a decision as a child when I came back. This is how I can get out of here. I can go do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which of course is not that easy. Yeah. But um it was something that I became very laser focused in on and I think a lot of my friends, you know, like I was called a SWAT you know, on the way back and forth to school because I'd wear these little 50p glasses and I'd have a, a little briefcase, like suit satchel, mm-hmm. uh, walk along. Because I loved rules. I loved the sense of structure. And uh, so when I got back, I said, okay, I am going to make this happen. And during the worst of times, that's what kept me going. That's what kept me away from trouble. That's what kept me at home. I was also very religious then at the time. I'm I'm no longer practicing Catholic. I am a collapsed Catholic. Um, But it was something that kept me very focused and I just wrote letters and prayed and did my homework and did every school show. And it was a type of focus that was when I think about it, Chris was kind of extraordinary for a child, mm-hmm. you know, because um, there wasn't really much fun to be had except in drama. Yeah. That was the funnest, most, that was the best place because everything else was tragedy. You, you know, my mm-hmm. father was ill. I, you know, my mom was trying to keep, you know, make ends meet. There was a war zone outside. It was, it was, it was really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, for me, I just, I found great solace in, in the acting and, and having just somewhere to go and things to play. And like I say, just pure and utter escapism. For me, it was a lifeline. Mm-hmm. And then at that time, obviously, being able to think that this could possibly be your life. If you could get out of here and, and make a life out of this acting, this escape well you, it, it would almost seem like you wouldn't have to escape anymore this would be the acting and doing the drama would be the majority of your time yeah you you would you would think that that's you know that was the plan it was very it was a very simple clear plan look life life changes and life ebbs and flows and whatever you think your plan is you know sometimes life gets in the way so coming to America happened. I made that happen. Getting into university happened. Full-time job in order to live, in order to pay bills f- while going to school full-time, taking a bus at five o'clock in the morning to get to campus every day. I had nothing, but I mean, I had incredible, I had incredible support from, from a few people in my life, but Ultimately, I was an 18 year old child who showed up in Los Angeles yeah. and all I all I could do for the first bunch of years was to li- to work and live to survive. Just, you know, um, I did pub theater. Mm-hmm. I created this pub theater troupe for a while um, on my days off. And I did actually did Spring Awakening um, at UCLA as part of the, the program. I managed to carve out time to do that, but I didn't really have the experience. If I had to go back and do it all again, you know, um, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have gone straight to America. Maybe I would have gone to London and had, had more of a, had more fun, Mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Uh, So I feel like, huh? At 18, you almost feel like you are an adult like because you're like 18 right I can I've left school this is it but you're really not you're a child at the end of the day and I'm flying halfway across the world by yourself that's a crazy thing I had no idea that I was a child all I knew was that I was grown up and I was making this happen and I was in the world and this was real and I was strong and I was a survivor and Oh yeah, and that was it. And when I think about that child, and I think about how lonely I was and what I actually had to to get over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So while hard. while you were in, it was UCLA you went. Yeah. Yeah. So while you were in UCLA, I read this. Were you the nanny for Danny DeVito and Ray Hartman? Yeah. 
Yeah, that was my job. Yeah, so a year and a half into my life in Los Angeles, a friend of a friend, as she called me and said, um, yeah, uh, they're looking for a nanny. Do you want to give it a shot? And I said, yeah. okay, but I only have the weekends and I work, I go to school full time. And long story short, met them, um, stayed with them for about six or seven days straight <laughs> as part of a trial. Um, <laughs> Shh. part of a trial um run and i'm still I'm still great friends with them now i mean i was i was their weekend nanny for many years and lived with them on the weekends and when i first met first met them danny was playing the penguin mm -hmm. so um that's that's how i met that's how i met danny for the first time i heard the strange kind of voice upstairs and I was like what's up and he came downstairs and he was getting into the character you know and he comes oh, in he yeah. had his fingernails painted and his hair was long <laughs> yeah. and um yeah and Rhea was still doing Cheers which is an incredible show if you haven't seen it um mm -hmm. it's ran for many years one of the greatest shows of all time and the kids were very young the three kids and now the kids are no longer kids Mm -hmm. and they're incredible human beings and Danny and Rhea are also and they really became a family for me you know was mm -hmm. and I had the most extraordinary adventurous life as a nanny you know um but with two people in Hollywood who were so real and so grounded yeah it's fantastic that's fantastic. unbelievable. So then when you finished UCLA, did you get an agent straight out of, of university or how did that, that come about? That, no, uh, uh, I got, hmm, a good question. How did I get my first agent? I, yeah, I got it pretty soon after out of university, actually. I think my, my first job that I got where I got my side card was on ER. Mm -hmm. And so I played this, this little the helper and they, they let me use my own accent and everything. I had a scene with Juliana Margulies, which was lovely. Um, yeah, it wasn't too long after that, but you know, the thing for me, it's a very complicated part of my life there because I never looked like anybody else. I never played the system or the game. You know, I was just myself. Mm -hmm. and uh of course i now know today that that's plenty to be yourself and look like the way you look and you know all that stuff but then it was at that time was um that was an interesting it was just an interesting time for me i was i was very lost um as a person and um i didn't really i, I I was still so young and I didn't really have, I didn't really have a lot to fall back on except myself mm -hmm. a lot of the times, you know. Did you ever consider coming home? No. No. Because I put too much pressure on myself to make the dream happen. Mm -hmm. That's it, you're way jarling. Everyone would know that you've went to LA to become an actor. And if you come home, it's just like, the pressure of that it's yeah i get yeah. that and it was a different time then too like like then i was a real story then i mean to be able to leave to to escape the troubles and to that was a really big story and if i came back and had an inverted commas failed in my mind then i don't think i could have recovered from that mm -hmm. so um i really set myself up for success yeah. And that was the only option for me. Okay. So then after a few years, you started Belfast Blues, which is a, a one woman show that you wrote about your life. Um, yeah. And I was lucky enough to see it in the Lyric. Was it last year, the year before? And it was um, like, I've always been obsessed with one person shows. I just playing all the characters and telling a story one person having an audience in the palm of your hand i just always found it fascinating what was your process to like start writing that what what made you want to write your story 
Well, I had written a bunch of short stories just for myself, memories and things like that. And then a friend of mine, Kim Terrell, she said to me, can you read me some of those stories? And I did. And she said, oh, my God, this needs to be something. And I was like, what are you talking about? They're just my stories. What? And I was also in an acting class at the time. Um, and there was an exercise in the acting class. It was a story exercise. So it's where you tell a story with no narration you just create the characters, no dialogue, just action. And the story that I chose very spontaneously, because this was a spontaneous exercise with no preparation, I was called upon in the class and I created my father's wake and my mother vacuuming under the coffin was created in that moment, in that class, completely just in the way that you've been inspired. I was completely inspired in that moment and I created the story and I floored myself. I thought, wow, you know what, what was that? And everyone in the class and people just said to me, you have, this has to be a play. And I thought, I'm not gonna go up on a stage and talk about myself. I'm just not gonna do it. And then what happened was the wonderful Kim Terrell had um, a virtual theater company at the time well ahead of the game as we're all virtual <laughs> yeah. now. and um, this was 2003 I think and um, so I went and recorded some stories and then she flew me to Wake Forest University where I workshopped the first half of the show with her guidance and Sharon Andrews and Jonathan Chrisman who ended up being my designer who has gone all over the world with me with the show and that's where I created the first act and uh, presented it. And then I presented it in LA for notes, for people giving me notes. And the only notes that I got were, where's the rest? That's a, that's a good note. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, wrote, I wrote the second half in six months. And um, so I opened the show in Los Angeles in a 30 seat room that used to be a shoe shop. Mm -hmm. And people were this close to me when I was doing the play. <laughs> And I ran that for 15 weeks. And, uh, and since then, I've done it at many, many, many different places over the years. Uh, what I found with writing, because a lot of time, it's best to just write what you know. Yes. And uh, from real life experience, mm -hmm. what I find is I can now almost separate myself from the piece that I've written. It's now became a character. And whatever happens to this character happens to the character. I kind of forget that it happened to me. And that's it's it's quite therapeutic in a way where you're just like, I I think about it with the, I think about the thought process that this character might be going through. And I'm like, I wouldn't think like that, but I wish I had of. And then there's different things. So it, it's an interesting thing to write your own story yeah. and to tell that story because it, it almost takes a life of itself. Yeah. and become something that maybe it wasn't before uh, and it will it will every time you perform it it will be completely different it will feel differently because the other character who you have not written who will be different every night is the audience mm -hmm. and because it's only you there is a great reliance on them to come on board and also to trust them that if they're quiet one night and roaring with laughter the next night they could both be having the same reaction. They just yeah. feel differently. And that's that's where the work comes in and the confidence and like, you know, just unapologetically telling the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when I was 17 or 18, I was lucky enough to uh, become a stage manager for a theatre company here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the theatre company would primarily put on plays with just one or two people. And what, what I found interesting, so in rehearsals, I would watch the actors and learn from them. But then when we would go on tour, it was, I just watched the audience. I was fascinated by how different an audience can be because they could be doing yeah. the exact same performance and yeah. the audience is just, and either way, they're absolutely loving it. And you've yeah. got them the whole way, but yeah. they just react in a different way. It's very, very interesting. I tell you the biggest lesson for me, the, the most difficult experience I had, well, I had one funny one and one very difficult one amongst all of the hundreds I've ever done. But the most difficult one was 
I was performing my show um, at the Soho in London, mm -hmm. Soho Theatre in Dean Street. And someone asked me if I would do a royal gala performance. And so this re really beautiful woman, it was an honor of, it was to raise money for Parkinson's disease. So someone thought it would be a good idea for me to do my show. So they'd just, you know, they'd cover my show expense wise, but they'd, they'd do a big party afterwards, but this would be before the party and this would be part of the ticket and raise a lot of money for Parkinson's. And I was like, no problem, absolutely. I say yes to everything, like, absolutely. And then I realized that I was telling a story about a wee girl from West Belfast growing up under British oppression in a London theater with a bunch of very, very aristocratic British people. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna tell this story and I don't know if I've told this publicly, I, I think I have, but anyway, it's really, it's really quick. I'll, I'll make it really quick, but it's a great story. So before I was waiting for the show to start, it was late, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I was saying to my stage manager, we have to start the show. Why are we waiting? Well, we're waiting for someone. I said, everyone's here. No, there's one person who's not here. They're important. I don't know who it is. I was like, right, okay. And then there was a knock on my door and it's like, we have to wait another five minutes. I was furious. I was like, no, we have to start the show. We cannot keep people waiting. And then I hear over the intercom backstage, someone's on stage, walks up stage, goes, oh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, we're so very sorry, but um, we're actually waiting for a very important guest and stuck in traffic. So before we get to Geraldine's wonderful play, um, I'm going to invite a friend up on stage and he's going to entertain you for a few minutes. <laughs> what is happening? This is, what is, I'm, I, this is crazy. So this woman, who happened to be uh, Princess Michael of Kent. <clears throat> she said, I'm going to invite my friend up and he's going to bend some spoons. <laughs> so this person that she invited up onto my stage before I tell my story was Yuri Geller. Yeah. And Yuri Geller came up on stage and bent some spoons. And then they went back to their seats. And then my stage manager says, the guest has arrived, we can begin. And I said, really? I'm going to go on and tell 90 minutes of this war-torn story after Yuri Geller has bent spoons and Princess Michael of Kent is in the audience. <sighs> so I went out onto the stage and I thought, F it. So I stood there and I began. Nothing. Not a laugh not a movement, not a noise. I mean silence for 90 minutes. I was destroyed by the end of that performance. Mm -hmm. And when the lights came up and I went to do my curtain call, the entire audience exploded wow. in congratulations and stood on their feet and clapped and encored and bravoed me and I will never forget that because I was in such judgment of them and I did not trust them and everything that was embedded of me culturally and historically and where I was from I couldn't have asked for a more brilliant response at the end insane uh -huh. That is insane. And you want to know who the person was we were waiting for? Yeah, I do. It was a BG. It was Barry <laughs> Gibb. No, Robin Gibb. So excuse me, Robin. Robin Gibb. It was Robin. And he's married to was married to a woman who actually is from Northern Ireland, who was part of the reason for me being there. Oh, so right, okay. all full circle. It was all respectful and beautiful and for a great cause. And it, it is a story of a lifetime. Oh, that is a great story. Trying to follow yeah. Yuri Geller, that's something. Fair play to you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you did it. So then it was from it, it was from Belfast Blues. Someone came to see Bl Belfast Blues, I think, and that's kind of how you got into the running for Rocky. 
Is yeah, Sheila that- Jaffe. Sheila Jaffe is an amazing casting director. She did The Sopranos and many, 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 many movies. And uh, Sheila, yeah, Sheila called me up and said, asked me to go for this audition. I thought you're out of your mind. <laughs> But I did it and I went and then I went back in again and um, and I ended up getting it because there was something about, I think, again, the working class vulnerability of what I brought in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was funny because she's supposed to be really pretty overweight, the character. So I just started eating like once I got the part, I was eating potatoes and things. And I was starting like, you know, and I got a, when I was on set, I think it was the first day or no it was a meeting I had with Sylvester it wasn't on set and I was like so I'm 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 trying my best and he goes he goes what are you doing I said uh, I'm putting on weight because the character goes go down I want you to put on where I want you where you are and I was like oh okay lose weight lose weight <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so funny because when I was a kid I uh I loved Rocky because I, I when we were my brothers did were in boxing club and like I was really shy and not a fighter in any way shape or form but they were like you're coming to boxing with us <laughs> so there was one time we had to go to boxing and we were sparring yeah and I was like shit but every time I used to have to psych myself up before yeah. boxing training scary. yeah yeah very scary especially yeah. for me I was like really sensitive I'm like I don't want to punch anyone and I'm definitely, yeah yeah not the money maker um yeah yeah so so then uh i would psych myself up by listening to like ah the tiger and the soundtrack of rocky and then i went in and didn't punch the fella but he didn't punch me because i danced about that stage and never got punched and the fe- like all the lads are like fuck shit would you smack him or something going crazy and i was like no, i'm telling rocky here i'm not getting punched at all just danced my way around it didn't get punched happy as larry uh so that must have been well when you've did Rocky did that seem like a time at like a moment that you realized that things would be a little bit different yeah I mean obviously I knew I'd, I'm I'm part of a legacy a cinematic legacy here I'll always be part of that um again my path wasn't perhaps my path has been unusual you know what, then I didn't have really the proper representation and then I didn't really use it to propel me. You know, I could have gotten a publicist, this, that and the other, but I I just, I, I didn't. And it, it wasn't in the cards for me. I had that and it was and it was great. And, and then I, I, I think Broadway was the next thing for me. Um, but I'll always, you know, my my favorite part of being in that movie is going home when people shut out their car windows and shout across the street at me. It's my yeah. favorite thing. I love it, and I love that I'm part of it. And I think I'm. I think you know when I look at it now, I think I was. I'm really good in that movie, mm-hmm. and I don't ever say that about myself. I think you're really good in that movie, G. You know, um, yeah. I just. I I suppose in a way once I escaped. My the war in Belfast and every great thing that has happened since. I'm just so grateful when that happens. I don't sort of use that to get to a, another place because mm-hmm. my drive isn't there. My drive is to have a really big full life. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's just different for me. So um, I, I love it when papers say Hollywood movie star, film, you know, it's like, <laughs> I know I've done, I'm just, I just happen to have done movies, you know, I don't. Yeah. I, buy into all that stuff it's not my thing I mean look I did not put on the contoured makeup for today or get my hair done or wear a frock or even earrings and um I barely wash my hair so you know you take me as like that's Hollywood (laughs) Uh, so then from that then you you went to Broadway because you said that's what you wanted to do because theater I I feel like for for actors having that chance to be in front of an audience there's nothing like it it's so different like from being on set because you do five six takes of a shot and they're doing all these different things it's not the same Mm -hmm. whereas if you're in a play and you're living in that moment there's just nothing like it so then you went to broadway you were in translations was that your broadway debut Mm -hmm. incredible play 
And then, so, so did you then move to New York? Was that what you yeah, wanted? Well, I was originally moving to New York because I was cast in Shining City that Connor McPherson was going to direct on Broadway. And I was already making that move mm -hmm. um, when Connor called a few days before and said that it all fallen apart. So I moved anyway because I, New York was always a place where I felt comfortable and it, the East Coast, also it's closer to home and mm -hmm. um, I'd done the LA thing. LA is not a place for me. I don't, it's fine to go and visit, but I spent 16 years there and I don't like being in the car for most of my life. You know, you just have to drive everywhere. So um, New York was always the place for me. And yeah, so, but when I moved, finally moved to New York five days later, I got rocky and had to move back to LA. <laughs> <Probably> <laughs> to the way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, do you know, it, this has been really weird experience for me, Jarlene, like, you know, like researching you, because I'm like, I know Jarlene now. <laughs> And I don't know that, I don't really know the Geraldine that like has done all these plays and movies. I'm like, this is really weird. She was like, it's so like that a, a scene that you were in Jerusalem with Mark Rylance. And like, I'm like, that's unbelievable. Uh, Cause we never really talk about like stuff like me. that. <laughs> yeah, we're always talking about me, it's all about me. Yes. Uh, so yeah. that was a defining moment for me in my life to get mm -hmm. that. I, I was I was on a, a really incredible run of Molly Sweeney at the Irish Rep. And it was one of the hardest things I've had to do which is to leave that run because they were extended, extended, extended because I got this part in Jerusalem on Broadway and I could not say no to it because to work with Mark was for me a, a dream. I'd seen him years and years and years ago doing the all male 12th night at UCLA. And I, I just, I just, could not have this experience and you know we played on Broadway for a number of months and then when it went back to the West End they asked me to come back with it wow. so I got to play Broadway and the West End so it was almost a whole year of my life and within that play you know I play Dawn who's his ex-wife and they have a child together and I come in in the middle of this three-hour play and have depending on how long we ended up taking in the scene you know 15 20 minutes maybe in the middle of the play and that's that was that was my role it was just he and I on stage having this incredibly emotionally sometimes drug fueled uh conversation about him and where he is and you know it's the king and the queen and then the prince was sent away for a minute and it was it was oh I, I just it was amazing. I, and, and working with Mark is, is an experience that changes you because even though I, I knew I was a good person, I treat people with kindness and I am not. However, he takes it to a whole other level. So he was a, a great leader, an incredible company leader who knew the names of the guy who scrubbed the toilets, who played cards with the crew, who knew the front of staff, who after three hours of that performance would stand outside and talk to the fans and sign things beyond like be beyond what you can imagine is human yeah. and the kindness and the curiosity and then the brilliance after the rave there was this big rave uh, scene at the very beginning and then and then the lights go down and he has an entrance as rooster where he comes in then he does a dance and every night he did a headstand into a trough of cold water and then drank three raw eggs. Oh my God. Every single performance. And after the rave, I would go side stage and I would watch this every night. And sometime, and he'd be like, oh, and he had this, this rooster thing that was like, oh, it was just amazing. Yeah, I feel like working with actors like that, that those once in a, generation actors that are just so generous like you say with their time with getting to know but it's it's on stage and, and sharing a scene with someone like that who is that generous that you, it's like the most natural thing in the world it would it would seem like just doing a scene with mark Rylance. I it actually blows my mind that i'm even saying that uh and that would just blow my mind so then how many years after was it that you got the harry potter play 
uh, well, I don't know how many years after. Uh, when did I? I think I started the end of 2017 with Harry mm -hmm. Potter. We started rehearsing, so it was really 2018 rehearsal, and then a year of, and then a year of shows. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, because I was lucky enough to see that in the West End because the tickets are like extortionate in the West End. So obviously it's in two parts. So I I wanted to go see it, but there was no way because it was like it was like two hundred and fifty pound each part, and I was like that's five hundred quid. I can't do that. But they did. There was this thing they ran like a Friday lottery. Yeah, the forty forty forty. I never win anything, and did I. You won it. I won and I went to see it and it was the best thing in the world. I absolutely loved it. I couldn't oh believe the luck because I never win anything and I won that. And yes. that seemed like something that it, it seemed like I wasn't watching a piece of theatre. It, it kind of changed the way I, I looked at theatre and what's possible on yeah. stage. Yeah. It, there's something ridiculous about that play. It's just unbelievable. And I love the fact that it was two parts. But how mm. was that as an actor? doing those exhausting. two parts exhausting I yeah imagine. i played the trolley witch and i played uh professor mcgonagall and um so i had i think the track might be different now but i was the original broadway um mcgonagall but there was a quick change where i had to get out of so i was in the trolley witch so i was in this i had oh i can't tell too much right about <laughs> can't talk too much anyway i have this this stunt that happens on stage but I had to come off and change. I mean, I think we got the change of one entire character into another in 27 seconds. That was the quickest we did it. The Broadway crew, Broadway dressers, there's nothing like it. These people, this is why my heart aches right now because Broadway is devastated, but it will come back. There is nowhere like it. There is nowhere like Broadway. There is nothing like being part of a Broadway play. There is nothing like feeling like that family and going for drinks on these certain places and being in New York City. It is tough going. It is exhausting to do eight shows a week. It is more exhausting to do Harry Potter yeah. <laughs> because of the length of the show and the much time it takes out of your life. And you don't have a life outside of the show because you have to rest during the day. Mm -hmm especially when you're of a certain age. Um, I mean, I jest, I mean, everyone, you have to rest and you have to take care of yourself. And I think this is a mistake that um, that TV and film people make a lot of the time say, oh, I could do a Broadway show. Eight shows a week, one yeah. second. It, it, eight shows a week is, is not for sissies. It's, no. but, but, but it's also like, I can't wait to do it again. I really want to, you know, do a, another great play on Broadway that's, um, or off Broadway. I mean, off Broadway as well, it's just, you know, as long as you gather, but but to perform in New York City and to have New York City come back. And I think, I think it's gonna take quite a few years to get back to where it was, mm -hmm. but, um, but we'll get there. And in the meantime, I just, I just think about all of those people who have lost their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so it's awful yeah but it will come back it will come back it Definitely. will come back. yeah so darling what are your plans for the future obviously it's very hard to plan in the future in any way but what are you hoping to to do in the next couple of years i'm doing a lot of planning i I've, I've spent this entire year reinvestigating what i want and what's going to make me happy because i think at the end of the day that's a very important question what brings me joy what makes me happy my personal life my new marriage you know we've been together for 12 years but recently married to be you know a lot of people say it's never imbalanced the career personal life i think for the first time in my life um these past years with with really getting happy in life. I think it's important to have your home sorted and have your life sorted if you can, um, because our business is crazy. Our business takes us away from home. Our business challenges us. Our business is exhausting. And so we have to be really solid, have a really good solid foundation at home. Um, so I'm so happy about that. And my next endeavor really is producing. I mean, I will still act. Uh, so I will, I have a short film that's ready to go. 
um, that I commissioned that I'm executive producing, producing, directing, and that'll take me back home to Belfast. That's ready to go. I just have to wait for it to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, I have another film that I can announce soon that I'm going to be executive producing. And then I have another film that I am in the middle of as a producer, which I hope to be able to tell the world about hopefully in a few months. Um, so I've basically made all that happen um, during this time of COVID because I need to feel empowered. And, you know, I'm at the second part of my life now. Hopefully I still have a long time to go. Um, but I think Chris, what comes with with age um you're really able to, i'm really able to look back and doing a, this interview with you and some recent conversations to look back and say whoa i did that whoa i made those mistakes all right but here i am today and coming home is a big part of it you know it's always been my dream to come home and and give back um I'm also creating a, a little charitable thing for kids back home as well, which again, I can talk about. I'm sorry, I can't tell you today, but you know, these are the things that are going to bring me, give me joy. Yeah. And um, so I'll also take another couple of great shows on Broadway <laughs> and um, yeah, but telling great stories, getting great stories out there on film and in the theater is something I want to, cause I love putting people together yeah. and um yeah. Uh, so just to finish off, what advice would you give for any aspiring actors or producers? I don't know how you become a producer, but uh, any aspiring actors who want to get into the industry or anyone who's already in it? Well, I think that there's some priceless advice that I was given um, via my friend, you know, Al Pacino and she are very good friends. And I tell this, I say this all the time. So if, if you're in this business and you're an actor and you need to do it, because I think wanting to do it is almost not enough. You have to need to do it because there's, there's too much rejection. It's, it's really, it's, it's tough. It's really hard because most of the jobs you go for, you won't get. Having said that, if you need to do it and you're in it and you're, and you're auditioning and you're going for stuff, for me, what helped me so much is when I was going for that job, you prepare, you know your shit, you do all of the breath work that you can to sort of calm down and you do not focus on getting the job, but you focus on having an opportunity to act, which is what Al Pacino told my friend. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you know, who knows? You didn't get the job because you wore the wrong shoes and it reminded the producer of her ex-husband yeah. you know you didn't get the job because your hair was the right wrong color or you're the wrong height or we never know why we don't get these jobs mm -hmm. but what you are in control of is having a great time in the room and giving a performance and you can tell people they say what do you do you say i act yeah i oh, act yeah, yeah. Yeah. Darling, thank you so much for doing this. It was an absolute pleasure. And it was an absolute pleasure to meet Mandy Patankin's dog. I can't believe it. <laughs> and my dog, and our Abe didn't make an appearance. Oh, I love Abe. That's okay. He'll he'll make other appearances. But yeah, I'm sorry. I I had quite a I've had quite a tumultuous morning and then Mandy Mandy and Catherine are going to get their vaccinations, thank God, their second dose. So I was very happy to take Becky, but it coincided with this. But hey. You know, there you go. I met Becky. I can't believe it. You met Becky, indeed. Maybe I'll bring Mandy on and you can meet him next time. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, darling, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you love. Thank you, darling. So there you have it, folks. That was Geraldine Hughes. An unbelievable story. Just very inspirational. And I got to meet Mandy Patankin's dog. I still can't get over that. That was mad. Uh, so next week, I am joined by West End star, Raymond Walsh. Uh, Raymond was in the Les Mis All-Star Concert uh, and he's an incredible performer and it's great to hear his story. So that's next week. Hope you join me for that. 
If you could tell your friends about the podcast, like and subscribe to the video. This has been Playing Pretend with Chris McIlvenny. See you next week.